Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Dripping with sarcasm and blistering decisions, these are just some of the ways in which the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has been characterized in a case involving vaping device manufacturers litigating the Food and Drug Administration's denial of some pre-market tobacco applications for flavored nicotine vaping products. And joining us today to talk through it is attorney and vaping advocate, Greg Troutman. Greg, thanks for joining us again on RugWatch. Brent, thanks for having me on again. Well, first off, you have to tell us what is the characterization you have for this decision and what is this decision? Well, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals came in hot. Um, this was a decision we've been waiting for for quite some time, greatly anticipated. And after oral argument, it seemed evident we were going to get this decision, uh, especially in light of the same court, a panel of the same court had issued uh, a, a stay opinion back in March of last year to Reynolds in its first um for I think it was Views or Vibe, one, one of its products on menthol um, uh, closed system uh, applications. And so the court, the court really sort of gave signals where it was going. And it confirmed that in this opinion. Yes, it was in total, the majority opinion was uh, 53 pages. Wow. Um, you said dripping with sarcasm. It's not often that you find a judge in an appellate court quoting Elizabethan literature. It was really quite amazing um, because, for one, um, it seemed that the court, and at least, who was the judge that actually wrote the, the majority opinion? It was Judge Andrew Oldham. And he was actually somebody that wrote the opinion in the prior parts of this case. Judge Oldham wrote the, and I forgot who else was on the panel with him, but Judge Oldham authored the stay opinion for Triton back in uh, the fall of 21. That was that was the surprise switcheroo opinion. Right, which he referred to quite a bit within this document. And that is what is stunning, is that I've never actually you know, read something where somebody, a third party to the vaping industry, so articulate or, you know, with such articulation was able to describe exactly the way in which the FDA has been trying to screw vaping in the U.S. Not been trying to, did. Did. And what's even more significant is this comes from someone who is not versed in this industry. And in the technology, and a matter of fact, in the opinion, he talked about the bewildering, num bewildering number of terms that are used to describe these products. And um, so for someone who's not versed in this space, it was even that much more impressive uh, that he wrote the way he wrote and wrote at the length at which he wrote and the depth at which he wrote. Is this a total rebuke? Like, I mean, did he send um, did he send the FDA packing to utilize that kind of a term? Well, at least in the three states that comprise the Fifth Circuit, he did. And what your viewers and you may not uh, recognize is there's actually a couple more cases that are pending in the Fifth Circuit. There are uh, a host of cases that are consolidated um, that Jared Nodger um, from out of Houston is litigating that have been stayed pending the outcome of the Triton case. I think we can safely say we know how those are going to go now. And then now, Reynolds has Reynolds has two appeals that have been consolidated on its um, closed system products, and we're awaiting a we're awaiting a ruling on the second stay motion, which by the way is before the same panel that decided the first stay motion back last March. I think we can safely assume we know how that's going to come out. I I will tell everybody in my opinion. This is the most significant legal uh, case or legal decision in this industry since Cetera in 2010. It's that important. And fill us in on that case. Cetera was the case that had it gone the other way, we would not be here right now. That was the case that held in 2010 the D.C. Circuit 
of which actually Brett Kavanaugh was on the panel, as was Merrick Garland. And they ruled that FDA could not classify vaping products as drug or drug delivery devices. Uh, they had to be treated as tobacco. And, and remember, the Tobacco Control Act had just come out at the time this case was argued. And so they, the court said FDA can regulate, but only as a tobacco product within the confines of the Tobacco Control Act. That really was a saving grace because at that point, the deeming rule hadn't been uh taken effect yet, and what wouldn't for another six years, that allowed the vape industry to really explode and take off from 2010. If you remember what it was like, the market was like in 13, 14, 15, early 16, um, that decision allowed the growth in, of this industry to where we are today because is can be traced to that decision. This is, I think, at least for this this generation of products, the equivalent of Cetera. So I have the decision here and I've called up page 18, which is uh, one that you suggested that we focus on. Um, what are we seeing here? What you're seeing here is right under the Roman numeral two, there are itemizes A through D. It goes through and lists the longstanding principles of administrative law that FDA violated in this case. And then Judge Oldham goes through in, in quite detail uh, in ABCD headings, describing and explaining um, the reasoning for the finding that FDA violated these rules. Now, this is definitely scathing if you, if you read through the actual specific stuff, but let's, let's take each of these. Um, you, mean the agency, wild, you, mean the wild, you mean the wild goose chase? Yeah, the wild goose chase. So from your you know, examples that you know of, an agency cannot invent post hoc justifications for its decision in court and outside the administrative record. So how does that apply here? Well, what that means is when an agency knows it's been caught, it can't, can't come walking into court and, and try to explain away what it's done or what it hasn't done. And that's exactly what FDA did here. Um, FDA came in at oral argument and in their briefs and tried to say, well, we really never gave the industry assurances because we couched them in terms uh, of the uh, weasel words that they used in their guidance is that this isn't binding on us or you. And the court didn't buy that. Yeah. Uh, and the judge, and, the, judge made, the judge made the statement about, uh, about talking about turning square corners. That when the government deals with the public, it, it has to it has to turn square corners when it when the public deals with it. Vice versa, it has to turn square corners when it deals with the public. And that's basically what, what he's talking about here is they cannot come in after the fact. They can't do what they did and then come in after the fact and try to explain away and justify what they did. Post hoc means after the fact. Right. So explain what it is that the FDA did. Well, as I, as I said, FDA came in and our, our the industry's argument was, well, we've relied upon all the guidance that you gave us leading up to from the very first guidance document you gave us, public meetings, you name it. Always FDA had assured, oh, well, you're not going to need the long term studies. And the reason why FDA told us it didn't need long-term studies is FDA admitted in its guidance is we know these aren't available and we know they're not going to have time to do them between now and when you have to file your application. They were going to try to do this on the back end. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. So there was a couple of things. So one was the long-term studies. Um, what is the next one? Uh, was then about marketing, right? They said that you needed to provide these marketing plans. They and they made a big deal about it, and then in the end, they didn't even read a single page. Well, and, and going back a little bit further than when we filed the PMTAs, I think FDA grossly underestimated the size and scope and depth of this industry from the word go. And I'll point to the initial proposal for the deeming rule, which was uh, filed in, uh, I think, April of 2004 or 2014. FDA estimated it was going to get no more than 2,500 PMTAs. It came along 
I think in 2018, and, and re-estimated, well, we'll get no more than 6,800 PMTAs. It got over six and a half million. Now, it's to me, is it's inexcusable that FDA didn't know what it was doing before it did it. When FDA deemed these products, included them in the deeming rule, it should have known what it was going to expect and at least been reasonable in its expectations. And I've, I've said for a long time, the timelines for compliance that FDA put in the deeming rule would have made sense. That would have been two years from the time of deeming to file your PMT. That would have made perfect sense for the numbers that they stated they thought they were going to get. You know, how many vape shows did we have? How many, what was the presence on the internet that they could have with a small amount of due diligence? And they were, they came to vape shows. They they were there at, at shows walking the floor. They had to have known their expectations were grossly underestimated. And when you estimate you're going to get no more than 6,800 applications and you get 6.5 million or more, I mean, that is, that's inexcusable. And, you know, they basically told us in the deeming rule that 90, I think they said 97% of the products aren't going to pass. Well, how do you know that before you even get the first application? I think this was, I think this process was fixed. I think they knew what they were going to do all along. It didn't matter what we did. They were going to, they were going to um, deny us. And when it comes to the post hoc rationalizations, one of the, one of the issues, and this is where the, their misinterpretation or misunderstanding, whether it was negligent or intentional, um, comes into play. FDA in, no, in not knowing and not figuring out what was coming down the road, um, when it, reality finally hit them, they had to find a way to very quickly and efficiently get rid of these applications. That's where the fatal flaw memo came from. Um, the fatal flaw memo was, we're not going to look at the entire application. We're just going to look at one aspect of it. Do you have long-term studies? Yes or no? Check the box. And if no, you go down the road of a of a MDO, a marketing denial order. And there were the vast majority, uh, I would say substantially all of the PMTAs, uh, serially went through that process. It was a routine check the box. Do you have this? If no, then you default to an MDO. And the Fifth Circuit said that is not um, acceptable. You have to review the entire application, and, and one of the one of the things where FDA got caught was in all of the guidance. It talked about um, the importance of the marketing plans because they were really concerned about underage access and underage youth, which is justifiable. Don't blame them at all for that. And so, but they told the industry your marketing plans are very important. Well, they didn't even review the marketing plans. And they came up with the post hoc rationalization of, well, um, we've seen enough of these that, um, we, from our experience, what you're saying, we already know what you're saying. We already know it's not going to be sufficient, so we don't even got to read it. And um, you know that's sort of a that's sort of a really um, crappy way to look at it because what what if what if I'm a judge and I say, well, I've seen appellate briefs before. I know what these arguments look like. I'm not going to even read the brief because I know what it says, and I'm not going to accept what it says anyway. Nothing you, nothing's written in there is going to change my mind. Uh, that was a real problem for the court. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get at um, the importance of this. I guess from a an emotional point of view. As you know, we've been covering this for eight years, and it's been endless, like uh, amount of changing um, guidelines and 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 switcherooing. I guess. I mean, what a good term that is for for this whole thing. I mean, is this well, a win? Is this a win? Oh, this is a massive win, and and potentially this freezes the field. Um, 
and there's going to be some uncertainty until we figure out how this is going to flesh out and where it's going to go. What FD, how FDA is going to react to this? Because FDA's natural inclination is going to be, well, we're the agency. Screw you, court. We're going to do what we want to do. Well, Judge Oldham, in his opinion, basically said you do that at your own peril. He actually he's aware the court's aware that the FDA could possibly say screw you. You know, one of the things you learn early on as an attorney is you don't want to piss off judges. And you especially don't want to piss off federal appellate judges. And I don't think that he's one you want to really want to mess with. I don't I don't I think FDA will be greatly sorry if it takes the um um the um FAFO challenge. Yeah, I yeah, I know I got what that is. Yeah. Now is there a chance, you know, in some back rooms that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals here could be dismissed because it's a conservative court, you know, with a large appointment from former President Trump. Well, I mean, you will you will find some folks that will take that uh, attitude. There's been a number of decisions uh, in the re- recent years out of the Fifth Circuit that have um, not been very agency friendly, and especially with FDA. Uh, the abortion pill case last year, the um, the case involving the uh, social media censorship during COVID, FDA was tangentially involved in that. So, yeah, some people will say that, well, this is an outlier because this is a wildly conservative circuit. Well, can we say the same thing about the Ninth Circuit or the Second Circuit or the D.C. Circuit because they're wildly liberal? It's, you don't get to do that. What Their opinion is just as important as any other circuit's. And where this goes from here, will it go to the Supreme Court? It's anybody's guess. We don't know. So, um, talk, so Greg, talk a bit uh, then for us about the issue with regard to these split decisions at the you know federal court of appeals level, because they're they're that's more likely actually to get this to to SCOTUS, isn't it? It 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 is. Now, it doesn't involve per se a constitutional issue. It involves a issue of administrative law under the Administrative Procedure Act and various the other other laws as well. The Supreme Court already has rejected several cert petitions uh, filed by in the industry, not just in the P, uh, MDO context, but also in other contexts as well. I know there was a challenge to the deeming rule a few years ago based on, um, yeah. Um, non-delegation doctrine. There was a, I think there was another constitutional challenge. I forgot what exactly was involved in that. They've denied all of those. But one of the issues we've got here is we've got, as you mentioned, is a circuit split. You've got 12 federal circuits, uh, 10 or 11 regional circuits in the District of Columbia circuit. And when you have a split of the circuits, that has to be resolved somehow to avoid what you talked about, is that The law is this in some areas, and it's something else in certain other areas. The Supreme Court will get involved to address circuit splits. And this, um, we already had a circuit split because of the Biddy case in the 11th Circuit in um, the summer of 2023. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, 2022. However, this this opinion makes that circuit split even stronger. Now, whether FDA will try to take this to the Supreme Court, we don't know. Now, that's not totally their decision. Who will decide that is the Solicitor General, who I really don't believe is likely to want to take on a case that is a likely loser before the Supreme Court. Because what happens if the what happens if FDA files for cert and the court denies it? Then it's going to have to live with the decisions of both the fifth and the eleventh circuit circuits. Well, that's six states that pretty much the entire southeast um, is under one set of rules, where everybody else is under a different set of rules. Um, if if the court takes the case, worse even worst case scenario is FDA loses. Then we have the Supreme Court says the fifth circuit was correct. That becomes then the law of the land. FDA's got to follow that everywhere. 
Now, what's going to happen? We don't know yet. Is FDA going to have to go back and re-review these applications? Is It seems to me most likely if FDA wants to stay on its present tact of prohibiting flavored products, it's going to have to go through some pretty cumbersome rulemaking, uh, which the court pointed out under the Administrative Procedures Act. It involves giving public notice, taking public comments, much like the menthol rule that is being debated right now. Right. That has to go to the Office of Management and Budget within the White House. And oh, by the way, FDA's initial proposed deeming rule in 14 included a full ban on all flavors in tobacco products. Well, OMB struck that out. So the deeming rule that we got in 2016 was absent that provision about banning flavors. I think it's likely that FDA would strike out a second time going before OMB. I think this is why FDA's done the done things the way they've done them with vaping products is because it 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 knows it goes back to OMB it's probably going to get shot down. And, and the court actually I, mentioned this, that a bit in the footnote basically saying that this was a de facto flavor ban. They did. And, and they they mentioned that well they mentioned that in a footnote in the uh, Reynolds stay opinion uh in March of last year, and actually Judge Jones is the one who's been pushing that. She is the um, she was the author of the of the Reynolds opinion, and she was on the panel initially when Triton, I think, is the one who really pushed on bank review. And she flat out said to FDA's lawyer at oral argument, "This is a this is a de facto flavor ban, and you didn't go through the rulemaking process." Um. That's going to be a problem for FDA. Are they going to retrench and change their position and relook at these applications um, through a new lens? Or are they going to go through the rulemaking process that they're going to have to do? Or are they just going to ignore it and say, screw you, court, we're going to do what we want to do? That remains to be seen. Now, this was Triton and another party. Vectasia. Right. So their MDO, so their marketing denial orders have been rescinded, and then it's they, their applications have been sent back to the FDA, where they where they are to review further or open up an, a new review. Correct, and you know that could take. Well, well I'll give you an example. The Biddy Court issued its ruling in August of 2022. Um, and and the Eleventh Circuit sent Biddy and those other, I think, five. Um, companies back into review and it's been crickets since then 18 months it's been crickets well jewel is still in review isn't it oh yeah uh, well jewel never jewel never has been adjudicated yet jewel in this was an interesting so i've got amicus briefs in that case is that jewel had submitted a very very lengthy pmta i would guess dare say probably one of the lengthiest of anybody and FDA just glossed over it. And when Juul filed its stay motion, it pointed out all of the glaring omissions and things that FDA had ignored, and they were going to get a stay. And FDA decided, well, we're going we're gonna to agree to put this back into submission. It did not want to take a loss from the D.C. Circuit at, at that point in the game. Um, and I think if they went back without doing anything further, they would take a loss, and again, it depends on uh, which panel they get. You know, there was a there was a, a case decided by the um, D.C. Circuit back back in the fall, back in the late summer, early fall, and it was a th three judge panel, two Trump appointed judges, and they ruled that um, I'm trying to think which company it was. They ruled for FDA with regard to one of the products. And they ruled against FDA with regard to the other, I think it was the menthol products. And it was, again, along the same lines of the Biddy case and along the same lines of what Triton, the Triton court found. So you've got really three cases now um, in our circuit split. And um, I, I, I think FDA is sort of in a little quandary right now. It's sort of, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. You got to wonder, you know, how much rebuking, you know, can there be before FDA's knees will shake a little bit? I, I don't know. My, my thoughts are is that the FDA is impervious to any of this. 
because they are, you know, they're at the pinnacle of the administrative state. Well, but they've also got Congress watching them now, too, because of the Reagan Udall report. Um, back in March, the House Oversight Committee sent a um, very scathing letter to FDA demanding information. I don't re- I don't know don't know if FDA's responded or not, and certainly House Oversight's been a little busy recently um, with the um, all the impeachment stuff. So. Um, with with Joe and with Hunter and and all of that mess, so I don't know when and if when or if they will get to this. Obviously, we're a low a rung issue compared to the other things they're having to deal with. But if they get to it, I I really would love to see what a public hearing looks like, where FDA has to come in and justify um, some of the things. I know that they were trying to get the um, comments, the actual comments that were given anonymously by the FDA employees. Hmm. You know, some of those some of those comments were scathing. Oh, you know, I've got them here. You keep talking, let me pull those up. Let's see if I can get and, them quickly. I mean, and I know one of the statements was written by in-house uh, member of the in-house counsel. And I honestly think it was written for the industry's lawyers to be red meat. That that's how I read it. And it it spoke in our language, in our lingo, um, of all of the problems that have gone on, the political, how this has become politicized, the the legal aspect of that. Um, you know, at some point, FDA is going to have to um, answer for everything it's done, how it's handled this uh, from the word go. At some point, it's going to have to answer. And this yes. decision by the Fifth Circuit um, makes that much more much more ev- inevitable. Yeah, it was it. It just seems that like you know things get piled on and on and on. But FDA to me almost appears a little bit like Bill Clinton, the Teflon Don. Well, you know, even the Teflon Don um, got sent to prison. <laughs> True. You know, John, John, where did John Gotti die? Not at home, in a federal prison. Yeah, you know, I've got so much material here, my friend, that I don't think I'm going to be able to find uh, those comments easy. But let's just say that, I mean, it went to the heart of the issue. I mean, it basically was anonymous comments by Office of Science staff, if, I, if I'm correct on that, that pointed directly mm-hmm. to political interference with regard to the approval of flavored uh, vaping PMTAs. And that's verified by the memos that came out in the logic case from the Third Circuit, where Office of Science, everybody within the office with all the different levels had signed off on the approval for the logic menthol product. Brian King comes in. One of the first things he did is the CTP director is um, he nixed it. He overruled the Office of Science. Yeah, I've got those memos. I've got those memos. I've got that. That's a political decision. It's a total political decision. You know what? I've got that at at hand. So let me just see here. I've got a Reason article on that from last year. These memos show that FDA regulation of e-cigarettes is driven by dubious value judgments rather than science. The yep. agency is determined to ban the flavors that sm- former smokers overwhelmingly prefer. Yeah, I mean, that's that's it. Well, this is what I'm saying is that like, I, I don't know um, what's going to crack FDA. Like my overall thoughts on this are that nothing may come of this and they'll just keep behaving the way they, they have been. Well, you know, they may. And, and if they do, I, I think at the end of the day, they're going to they're going to get smacked even more because the science in the period of time that we've been messing around with these PMTAs from the time we filed them through the all the MDO appeals to the present, we've had some really good scientific studies have come out. Because we've had some places that have enacted flavor bans. A number of places have. 
And there's been research done, the Abigail Friedman study, uh, the, the Michael Pesco study that came out not too long ago. You know, when you're increasing 15 cigarettes for every 0.7 milliliters of e-liquid that's banned, that's three quarters of a pack of cigarettes. You know, we've done pretty darn good getting the smoking rate down to where it is right now. I mean, for youth, it's almost not measurable for, for smoking. And for adults, it's approaching 10%. That's all happened in the last decade. And I find it hard to believe that these vaping products aren't a good measure of the reason why smoking is reduced for both adults and for youth. Now, don't get the idea that I'm in favor of kids using these products. I'm not. But if given the choice between smoking and taking up the habit of smoking and using these products, obviously, um, you know which way I'm going to go on this. And what's funny and, and sadly ironic is some of the same people who are wanting to deny harm reduction products to youth were the same people who two decades ago or three decades ago, were, decades ago were promoting condoms for, for teenagers to prevent pregnancy, disease, et cetera, et cetera, as harm reduction. So they're selectively cherry picking what harms they want reduced. Oh, that's so true. I mean, we call it the hypocrisy of harm reduction. And, you know, you've got kids, the reality is you've got kids 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old that are smoking. How are we going to get them off those cigarettes? Now, I'm not in favor of them using them, but, you know, by goodness, if they're using cigarettes, we got to find a way to get them off the cigarettes. And if they're using these to stop smoking, then I really can't object too strenuously over that. Now, for the kids who don't do anything, I absolutely don't want them using these products, starting using them, taking them up, anything. But for the kids who are smoking or otherwise would smoke, those are two categories. And you've got kids that are risky. Kids are risky. And, and teenagers are no different today than they were 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Teenagers do stupid things. They drive too fast. They drink. They do risky things because they're teenagers. It's what teenagers do. Um, for many, many years, it was smoking. That's how you rebelled as a teenager. Well, vaping is the new rebellion. But in the same token, that rebellion in, in some aspects has good qualities to it to the extent that it's brought the kids off of cigarettes. So what's your position then on recreational nicotine? Because I, and I use this example a lot and I'll quickly say it again, is that in Canada, for instance, you know, famously, uh, the Trudeau liberal government made uh, marijuana legal in Canada in 2018. And anywhere across the country, when you turn say 21 years old, if you've never smoked a joint before, as soon as you're age majority, you can walk into a government owned pot store and get hooked on weed. So how come that's OK? But somebody who's never smoked a cigarette or tried a vape before when they become the age majority, should they not be allowed to go into a vape shop and, and get themselves hooked on vaping? Well, uh, you know, if you're an adult, you're in a, you get to make adult decisions. And you have to live with the consequences of those. That's the libertarian in me comes out that says, you know, what's what's it our business to tell them what they can and can't do? If they're not hurting anybody, um, you know, you, the difference is you can you can buy buy weed or other products, make you high, you can get in an accident, kill somebody, just as they'll be just as dead if as if you had used alcohol. But I don't see how the nicotine gets to there because you're not going to be vaping the nicotine is going to make you have an accident or kill somebody or, or harm somebody else um i find it very unlikely that to happen if, if you're just going to recreational use it fine if you're an adult i've got no problem with it don't tell me how to do things in my life and i'm not going to tell you to do things in your life love it so okay 
Um, I don't get a chance to bring this up, but I think there might be, this might be a good place to do that. I'm frustrated because one of the things that the progressives, the public health people, the anti-vaping zealots that are progressives, they say all the time that nicotine harms developing brains and a young person's brain doesn't fully develop until they're 25. That's a strong statement, basically saying that until you're 25, you really don't have the brain development enough to make your own decisions and, and so forth. Thus, we have to protect you from the big, bad you know, tobacco companies. So if indeed uh, your brain is not developed until you're 25, how come the progressives keep pushing to lowering the voting age? They want 16-year-olds to vote, but at... 17 or 18 or 19, they're not old enough to pick up vaping and make that choice. So like, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that they want, want that. I absolutely shut up a politician one time when they were spouting that out. And I said, so, so if you, if you don't want people to do things until their brain is fully developed, then why don't we raise the voting age to 25? Because we don't want half brain people voting. Totally. Oh, we can't do that. And in response to their argument, you know, the army back during World War II gave cigarettes out to 17, 18 year old, 19 year old kids who were in the army who were smoking. That was the greatest generation. What did that greatest generation do? They built the world we live in, for sure. They built the world we live in. It didn't harm those developing brains. No. (laughs) And. You know, they come up with this based upon testing with mice and rats. Well, mice and rats have some similarities with humans, but they're not humans. They've never tested these actually on the brains of of kids to see what it does. They're postulating this is what's going to happen. Totally. Okay, so let's get back to, and my fault for uh, derailing us there. Let's get back to- No, that, no, that, that that was a good place to go. That was very useful. There you go. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. They drive me crazy. Um, Okay, so this decision across the board, they're like every other vaping company that's got an MDO. There's at least half of them, if not most of them, we're all in a similar position as these companies. So uh, because these were this was not specific issues to these companies and these PMTAs that this decision was made on. So, I mean, doesn't it doesn't it mean that all of them should get put back in a review? You would think so. And I, I doubt FDA is going to do that unless they're forced to do so. So, um, and I know what you're thinking. Are we going to try to force that? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, I can tell you the attorneys for represent stakeholders in this industry have been the last week a lot of time talking and in thought, and there's going to be a group of us in, together in Vegas in a couple of weeks at a symposium, and I can guarantee you we're going to have a lot of discussions behind the scenes about how we're going to go forward, what we're going to do. Like, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a gift has been handed to the industry here, and it won't always be there, like, because time hurts these kinds of things. So, like, it's imperative that the industry moves. We've got a brief and narrow window to, if you remember the, the original Star Wars, at the closing battle scene when Luke had to hit that exhaust input. Yeah, uh, that was Empire Strikes Back, wasn't it? It was the first, it was the first, the first Star one. Wars, whatever, right. whatever it was. And he had, to, he had to hit that and he had, you know, a limited space to do it in and limited time to do it in because not only were they on his tail, he was in a real small confines. We're kind of in that same position. Um, we've got we've got to we've got to work together for one. We've got to come up with a strategy that we think is the best arguments we've got and run with them. And it might be even a multi-pronged strategy. It might not just be one thing we do. It might be multiple things we do. Those are things that we're working on to hash out. And um everybody stay tuned. Um I think you're going to see some things come come out in the next uh, month or so, couple months that um, might take this decision and ramp it up a bit. Well, that's excellent. And I almost want to end on that, but I'm mindful that we 
do have one more topic to talk about, and that's how all this may affect legislation at the state level. Well, you know, Altria has got bills that they're floating in a number of states that would ban, it's similar to the Oklahoma and the Louisiana bill, that it would ban uh, the sale in the state of vaping products that have not gotten FDA approval. Well, if to the extent that this decision prevents FDA from approving products, it's sort of, I think it's going to stymie those bills. Because if a state passes a bill that says you have to have FDA approval to market your products, but if FDA cannot give approval, and, and there's been an intervening force that it stopped that predicate, I think those bills would be ripe for challenge. I think the states would lose. So I honestly think it's going to make the state have to sit back and think. Uh, that's what I said earlier about freezing the field. This is part of freezing the field. I think it may uh, make these uh, bills a little bit harder to pass. Well, I'd sure like to be a fly on the wall and say campaign for tobacco-free kids boardroom. Oh, that would I would have loved to have been. Um, wouldn't you love to have been with the pave bombs the other day? <laughs> well, maybe not. No matter. I don't think anything would make me happy to have to do that. But, you know, there you go. Well, so do you think we have hit everything here, Greg? I think we have. Um, you know, I'll come back on here later uh, when we have fleshed out a little bit where this is going and what we're going to do and uh, maybe give you an update of, of where we go. And, you know, we, we're in a wait mode right now to see what the Supreme Court does. The ball's now in their court. And, you know, how they react is going to depend a lot on what we do. And, and I've said for a long time uh, that FDA is going to get the marketplace that its policies dictate it deserves. And if they're screaming now, but there's a black market, well, why is there a black market? Prohibition didn't work in the 30s and the 20s. Pro the war on drugs has not worked. And this is not going to work. Well, that's great, Greg. I mean, you, you've you got some great lines. I love the lines. So you've got to remember some of these one-liners that you've had. So thanks for your hard work on all of this and all the other attorneys, of course, Eric Heyer and Azim and everyone that have been uh, making this happen and good luck and just stay right there and we'll say our proper goodbyes. So that's it for this edition of Reg Watch. Uh, please follow us on Facebook, uh, like us on Facebook and follow us on X. And uh, if you get a chance, uh, you can support us at uh, support.regulatorwatch.com. Thanks very much, guys. Have a good evening.